History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 533rd episode of the History Goes Bump podcast, Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I'm your host, Diane. And this is Kelly. It's so funny, Kelly. I was listening back to an older episode and we were starting to get into the triple numbers and I was like, oh, these are getting harder to say. (laughs) Little did I know, 533 (laughs) episodes later, we're going to be covering a location called Fort Riley. This was suggested by our listener and executive producer, Ed Jones. This is a base that's in Kansas. There's a great history here. It's been around for 150 years. Wow, nice. Lots of haunts. Kelly, we have two live shows planned. We're going to be hosting them with Hillbilly Horror Stories. Yes, we are. Right here in Florida. The first one is at Casadega. It's a spiritualist camp. And the location that we're actually hosting it at is a haunted location, Hotel Casadega. Yep, definitely looking forward to it. This will be on April 27th from 12 to 3 p.m. And it is a very small venue. We have 30 tickets. So don't think about this one. Get on it. And then the other one is in one of our favorite cities, St. Augustine. We're going to be doing it at the same location we did our previous live show in St. Augustine. And that is going to be on August 17th from 6 to 9 p.m. Looking forward to that one as well. Get your tickets. We have the links up in the Facebook Spooktacular crew and also set up a link that you can get through Instagram as well. Before we get into talking about Fort Riley, we want to welcome into the Spooktacular crew a whole lot of people. We had a lot of people join us this week. (laughs) We're very excited about that. Rhiannon, Crystal, Dusty, Lynn with one N, Heather, Alina, Stephanie, Sherry with an I, Abigail, Jose, Kimberly with an L-Y at the end, Lisa, Sheraldon, Mary, Gwynny, hope I said that right, Summer, spelled S-O-M-E-R, Andrea, and Catherine with a C. Thank you so much for joining the Spooktacular crew. And now, this moment, Naughty. Rock and Roll Granny isn't a label you hear very often. However, this is the moniker that Cordell Jackson had been bestowed. She was born in 1923 in Mississippi, and with her father's career as a musician, Cordell was taught guitar, double bass, and piano from a young age. She started performing with her father's band and eventually began writing music and lyrics. In 1943, she married and moved to Memphis, Tennessee. She then began installing recording equipment in her new home so she could record herself as well as other local artists. One demo recording was of Sam Phillips, who ended up creating Sun Records, who became the label for icons like Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, and Roy Orbison. In 1956, Cordell founded Moon Records' label on the advice of RCA Records' Chet Atkins. She had been having a difficult time competing with male artists, so this was a more effective way to get her music out to the world. Cordell wrote, engineered, produced, and arranged her own music, and soon she had recruited other performers like Alan Page, Earl Patterson, and Johnny Tate. Primarily a solo artist, the rock and roll granny would occasionally have a backup band. Cordell performed on shows like Late Night with David Letterman, and appeared in a Budweiser commercial featuring dueling guitars with Brian Setzer. She had a prolific musical career, but only released one solo full-length album titled Cordell Jackson Live in Chicago which was released in 1997. The rock and roll granny died on October 14, 2004, of pancreatic cancer in her beloved home of Memphis, Tennessee. Turn out the lights. The party's just getting started. And now, this month in history. In 
month of April on the 3rd in 1783, Washington Irving was born in Manhattan, New York. Irving was an American short story writer, historian, biographer, and diplomat. He was well known for his collection titled The Sketchbook of Jeffrey Cran, Gent, which contained literary pieces like Rip Van Winkle and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Irving began his career with an array of observational letters to the Morning Chronicle, written under the pseudonym Jonathan Oldstyle. In 1815, he moved to England for a short time, and that's where he first published the sketchbook of Geoffrey Cran, Gent. A few of his historical biographies included Muhammad, Oliver Goldsmith, and George Washington. He also wrote several histories of 15th century Spain covering topics like Christopher Columbus and the Moors. In the 1840s, Washington Irving served as an American ambassador to Spain. He was one of the premier American writers to earn recognition in Europe, and he supported other writers like Longfellow, Herman Melville, and Edgar Allan Poe. Irving championed writing as a legitimate profession, and he worked to establish better laws to protect American writers from copyright infringement. Washington discovered Terrytown, now known as Sleepy Hollow, during a yellow fever outbreak in Manhattan which had prompted his parents to send him up the Hudson River to stay with a friend. He fell in love with the area and would make several trips there, he had a home there, and of course he was buried in Sleepy Hollow as well. Washington Irving died of a heart attack in 1859, just eight months after finishing his Washington biography. Fort Riley sits on the north bank of the Kansas River near Junction City in Kansas. The military installation has a history that stretches back more than 150 years. Early on, the soldiers' missions were to protect the overland trails that settlers were using to move west. Eventually, they protected the railways being built. The fort would eventually become important in training the cavalry and served as a training center for every major war. Today, it's still a working base with several museums dedicated to its history. Many locations repeatedly have some strange things happening. Join us as we explore the history and hauntings of Fort Riley. great name this place has <laughs> it's only because it's got the name of your little heart dog I riley know, my little riley <laughs> she's such an angel uh-huh, sometimes uh-huh. <laughs> like we say she's lucky she's cute <laughs> or she would be dead <laughs> fort riley started off as camp center in north central kansas that name was because the outpost was considered the center of america well, that makes sense. <laughs> this is why we used to like to go to the Haunted America conference, because we're like, we're in the middle of the country. So if people want to meet up with us, everybody kind of has to travel from the same amount of distance, unless you live right there in Missouri or Illinois. Surveyors laid it out in the fall of 1852, and three companies of the 6th Infantry arrived in the spring to build temporary quarters. The name of the camp was changed to Fort Riley on June 27, 1853, in honor of Major General Bennett C. Riley, who had led the first military escort along the Santa Fe Trail in 1829. Using his name makes sense, since the initial goal of the post was to protect people taking part in western expansion over the Oregon and Santa Fe Trails. Between 1840 and 1860, nearly 400,000 people used the Oregon Trail. Wow. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's a, a lot, lot of people. people which stretched 2,170 miles between the Missouri River and the Oregon Territory. The original trail was laid out by fur traders starting in 1811. The route branched off into the Bozeman Trail, the California Trail, and Mormon Trail. Many towns were established along the way. The Santa Fe Trail was established in 1822 and connected Franklin, Missouri to Santa Fe, New Mexico. This trail was started by Native Americans, and then came the trappers and traders, and then the settlers. The particular spot chosen for Fort Riley was on a plain overlooking the Kansas River Valley. Materials in the area were used in the construction, and this was mainly limestone that was cut in a pasture-cut style. This means it had a smooth surface. The design was typical of the time, with a center parade field, with officers' quarters on the north and south sides, and enlisted barracks on the east and west sides. A hospital was also built on the east side, and other buildings were on the south and west sides including stables and quartermaster's storage. 
In 1856, a cholera outbreak left 75 to 125 people dead. Listeners are probably aware that before the Civil War, states like Kansas and Missouri had internal strife about whether they would be slave states or not. Between 1854 to 1859, there were several scuffles that got increasingly more violent that were called Bleeding Kansas. Pro-slavers were called border ruffians and abolitionists were called free staters. Both sides carried out raids, assaults, and murders with at least 56 political killings. The main issue, of course, was whether Kansas would gain statehood as a slave or free state. And the reason this was so critical, other than the fact that, you know, you obviously don't want to have more slave states entering the country, was because with statehood, Kansas would get two senators, and that would affect the balance of power in the Senate. The Senate was split on the issue. Missouri had entered as a slave state in 1821, so it tried to influence what was happening during Bleeding Kansas. Kansas eventually broke into a state-level civil war with two separate capitals and constitutions. Oh, wow. I did not know that. I didn't know that either. I was like, holy cow. Kansas was admitted as a free state, but because they had all these skirmishes and the fact that they went to this length of having separate capitals, separate constitutions, it revealed that a national civil war was inevitable. If this is happening in a state, imagine the country. Right. And of course, as we know, that did happen. Troops from Fort Riley were asked to not only patrol the Santa Fe Trail, but now they were needed to put down outbreaks of violence across the territory. The Civil War broke out, and while there were still pro-slavery people in Kansas, the Union always maintained control. But there were many skirmishes along the Missouri and Kansas border. During the war, many troops were sent eastward to fight, but some stayed at the post, so it could be used as a prisoner of war camp. And there were still people traveling west that needed protection. I imagine there would have been a lot just trying to get away from the Civil War stuff. Certainly. After the war, the troops were used to guard construction of the Kansas Pacific Railroad from Native American attacks. The plan was to build the railroad from Kansas City to Colorado and then on to California. But there were not enough funds to get past Colorado. Eventually, it was consolidated with the Union Pacific in 1880 and is still a part of that today. A couple of interesting characters that were stationed at the post in 1867 were Lieutenant George Armstrong Custer and Wild Bill Hickok, who served as a scout. Custer was sent off to the plains of East Colorado on a campaign and was later court-martialed and suspended for one year when he returned to Fort Riley without permission so that he could see his wife. In the mid-1880s, the Army decided to officially establish a cavalry and light artillery school at Fort Riley and more buildings were added with these stones being rough-edged that is referred to as a hammered stone. So now you can see how they can tell which are the original buildings, because the sure. original buildings would have more smooth stone to them. If it's got rough stone, it's a newer building, which it's still from the 1800s, so I don't know how you could really call it a newer building. But A well-known group that was stationed at Fort Riley were the 9th and 10th Cavalry Regiments of All Black Soldiers, otherwise known as Buffalo Soldiers. The indigenous people called them that because their hair reminded them of the hair on buffaloes. Their main time here was in the 1920s and 1930s, and during World War II, they joined the 2nd Cavalry Division. Training the troops in cavalry tactics at Fort Riley was the finest in the world. The relationship between rider and horse was refined here. Cavalrymen were always testing their skills, and one intense ride was called the Russian Ride. This was a three-mile ride that had 24 jumps of varying degrees of difficulty, and some objects were very unusual. These are things that you wouldn't normally come across on a trail, but they really wanted to test to see the skill of the horses and the rider. And a student couldn't graduate from the cavalry school until they had conquered the dreaded Cemetery Hill. This was a hill that was a very steep drop. I have a picture of it. I'll put it up on Instagram. Kelly, did you ever see the movie The Man from Snowy River? Yes. This was a very similar and treacherous ride that tested skill and bravery. In the movie, for those of you who haven't seen it, or if you have, this is a reminder, the character of Jim is lying almost completely back on the horse as they traverse down a very steep mountainside, and they're not going slow. He is riding, he's hauling butt, let me put it that way. Indeed. Because he's chasing a whole group of wild stallions. And the scene was done in one take, and is one of the most memorable in movie history. It will give you chills. If you haven't seen it, Google it. They do have it up on YouTube. 
It's just one of the most amazing things. And I still remember it to this day. And I saw it as a kid. The cavalry school continued until October 1946, and any tactical training with mounted troops in the Army ended in 1947. The last horse-mounted cavalry charge by a U.S. cavalry unit took place on the Bataan Peninsula in the Philippines in early 1942 during World War II. There is still ceremonial horse-mounted cavalry, but the term now is used for the mounted recognizance and target acquisition. Helicopters are referred to as air cavalry, and there is a mechanized armored cavalry. Basically, tanks are the new horses. Here comes the cavalry, or the cavalry has arrived, is used in our modern vernacular to indicate that something has arrived just when needed. Anytime you watch any of these war movies, whether it's way back in medieval times or coming more forward, it does seem like when the cavalry's there, now we're going to win. The World Wars required lots of men to be trained quickly to go to war. In 1917, Camp Funston was built five miles east of Fort Riley, and this became a training center for up to 50,000 men. The 1st Division trained here was sent to France in the spring of 1918. Around this same time, the Spanish flu of 1918 hit Fort Riley. The camp would later be dismantled, only to be rebuilt again in 1940 for World War II. In an area known as Republican Flats, a barracks was built and called Camp Forsyth. Through to 1945, 125,000 soldiers were trained between Camp Funston and Camp Forsyth. Boxing great Joe Lewis and movie star Mickey Rooney were two of those soldiers. I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. Good for you, Joe Lewis. President Franklin Roosevelt visited Fort Riley on Easter Sunday in 1943. And just as a little aside, we are recording a little bit earlier in our recording schedule, but tomorrow is Easter Sunday. It sure is. <laughs> camp Funston eventually became a prisoner of war camp. And now a little break for a word about one of our sponsors. Fort Riley became a key training facility during the Korean War. Recruits came from all over the United States and the 37th Infantry Division, made up of units from the Ohio National Guard. During the Cold War, members of the Big Red One started arriving at Fort Riley. This is the 1st Infantry Division and got its nickname from its shoulder patch, which is a Big Red Number 1. I love that. I'm <laughs> like, the Big Red One, what is that all about? And yeah. it's like, it literally is a the big, big red, red one. one. <laughs> <laughs> they initially occupied the barracks at Camp Funston. New quarters and barracks were built and called Custer Hill. A new hospital was also built and named for Major General Irwin. In 1966, 50,000 more acres was added to Fort Riley. The 1st Infantry Division was deployed to Vietnam during the Vietnam War. The Big Red One returned in April 1970. The Gulf War saw Fort Riley deploying troops again. Most of the Big Red One was transferred to Leighton Barracks in Germany in 1995, and it wouldn't be until 2006 that they were welcomed back home. They were shipped off for a long time. Yeah. With that, a new era began and a new division headquarters was built along with barracks and dining hall, and improvements were made to Marshall Army Airfield. Troops were sent to Iraq to train Iraqi security forces. The Army website says of the Big Red One and Fort Riley, the 1st Infantry Division continues to proudly serve our homeland. Ever brave, responsible, and on point, the Big Red One team is absolutely committed to each other, our families, and our communities. That sense of teamwork is what makes Fort Riley a great place to come home to and what separates us from other Army divisions or installations. Fort Riley and the 1st Infantry Division, first for the nation. With this long history, it is no wonder that there are many areas that have reportedly experienced strange happenings. The Central Artillery Parade Field is on historic main post. In 1887, the cavalry and artillery split their parade fields with the cavalry taking the original and a new one being set up for the artillery. The Artillery Parade Field now hosts the annual Fall Apple Day Festival. This has a very strange apparition. People claim to see a woman wrapped in chains walking across the field on clear nights. I have no idea what the backstory is on that, why there would be a woman wrapped in chains. It does not sound like it's a good apparition at all. No, it sounds very bizarre. 
And I hope they've done some investigations to make sure you didn't have somebody murdered or something near there. Right. The Cavalry Parade Field has its own haunts, too. There are claims that a group of spectral riders is seen galloping across the field. They are also heard. Most reports claim that there's a sound like thunder and the feeling of a low vibration. So you can imagine people are like standing on the field going, what's happening here? Are we having an earthquake in Kansas? And then the group of riders appears. Then the riders slow at the intersection of Sheridan and Forsyth Avenues, where a rider dismounts, and then the rest of the troop wheels around and rides away. That intersection is where Custer had once lived. The house burned down many years ago, but apparently the riders are accompanying Custer on his ride home as his escorts. The story behind this could be that Custer wanted to get back to the fort because he was worried about the cholera outbreak and he thought his wife might be in danger. So, you know, earlier we said he was court-martialed for doing this. Right. Now, maybe people can kind of understand why he wanted to do that. He wasn't just missing his wife. He wanted to make sure she was okay. He had an escort of his men ride back with him, and he found his wife Libby to be fine. Could this be a residual haunting? But what is fascinating, if this is a residual haunting, is how is it creating the sound and the low vibration at the same time? And it sounds like such a long apparition. You know, yes. from the moment that everybody starts feeling the low vibration and everything to the point where they ride to that location and a rider dismounts and then the whole group rides away. <laughs> yeah, that is just incredible. It always strikes me as weird, like what parts of history get imprinted on a place? Like, why was that imprinted? Obviously, Custer would be worried about his wife, excited to see her. But why would that like? moment be frozen in time there. It's just weird. I love the paranormal for that. Near where the Custer house once stood is what was called Quarters 24. This was constructed from limestone in the 1850s and today is a museum named the Custer House. The house has been renovated and has furnishings from the 1870s and 1880s and best represents the kind of building Custer would have lived in with his wife. Hauntings here date back to 1855 when many people lost their lives to cholera in the building. Soldiers claim to see full-bodied apparitions and people visiting the museum claim to hear moans and to see ghosts. A sergeant who worked in the building in the 1970s claimed to often hear strange noises coming from the upstairs rooms. These sounds resembled what sounded like stamping feet on the floor. Other people claim to hear what sounds like someone pulling a boot on and then stamping the foot to get the boot fully on. When people go to investigate the sound, they find no one upstairs. This sergeant also reported that a teddy bear in the children's room kept moving around. He would place it on the bed before leaving, and then when he got there the next day, he would find the bear on a rocking horse in the room. A female soldier would arrive in the morning and find a bed looking as if it had been slept in, and she also always felt like she was being watched in the museum. The infantry parade field was used for a time as a polo field. The ghosts of two polo-playing men are seen riding their horses and playing polo. A soldier was walking across the field one night when he began to hear faint shouts and cheers from a distance. Then he saw what looked like two figures playing polo. The ball came flying up towards him, which again, wow, this is crazy. And then the players started galloping towards him. As they got close enough for him to see details, he noticed that one of the figures had no face, but instead a grinning skull. (laughs) This is how you know these aren't a couple of real men playing polo in the field. The spirit then yelled at him, leave now while you still can. The soldier listened and ran, and I'm sure he had a streak of uh, yellow stuff behind him. (laughs) I or would. Brown. <laughs> would. Well, that's true. I would do one or the other in my pants if that happened to me. The lower parade field has a ghost rider, too. This specter gallops madly across the field in the morning, only to disappear as quickly as he appeared. The Spanish flu pandemic that hit in 1918 took many soldiers' lives. One of them is thought to haunt an area outside of the old World War I era gymnasium. A public works employee was repairing some downed electric lines in the late 1960s when he reported seeing the ghost of a soldier in a World War I uniform. He appeared to be continuing his patrol wearing a heavy wool overcoat and carrying a rifle over his shoulder. The weird thing was that a snowstorm had downed the lines, and when the worker went over to offer the soldier some hot coffee from his thermos, the soldier disappeared, and there were no footprints in the snow. I would have loved to have seen the look on that guy's face when he's like, you know what, I'm going to offer that guy over there some coffee. He's probably pretty cold and 
he goes to walk over and all of a sudden he's like, where the hell did he go? And then he looks down and it's like, this is fresh snow. Nobody's been walking on it but me. What did I just see? The main hospital has had issues with its fire alarms going off on their own, especially in the biomedical room. One day the alarm went off eight different times and the fire marshal got tired of coming out for all these false alarms. So he's like, you know what? I'm disconnecting it. It didn't help. Kelly, that alarm went off three more times. Oh, my gosh. How does that happen? It's disconnected. (laughs) The NCO club had an MP report that an unseen force jerked open the door he was guarding. The door had been locked. The number one stable had years of reports from soldiers serving on night guard duty that they would see a man in period clothing ride through the stable and then disappear. There was actually something to back up these stories. When years later, some renovation work was being done and the skeletons of a horse and rider were found in an old ravine. Oh, wow. Who did not miss them? That they didn't try right. to look for them? or And I would love to know, what was the rider wearing? Was this like somebody who'd just been traveling on one of the trails? Was this a soldier? Did they think that he had like gone AWOL? Possibly. There is a house known as Quarters 124, and a legend claims that a woman drowned herself in a well on the fort grounds in the 1860s. This woman now haunts the house, and residents have reported hearing loud noises during the night that include what sounds like someone dragging a wooden box up and down the stairs. My goodness. (laughs) The noise got so unbearable that a priest was called in to do an exorcism. The noises stopped for a time, but eventually returned. The Post Cemetery is haunted by Major Louis A. Armistead of the 6th United States Infantry Regiment. His wife Cornelia Armistead died of the cholera epidemic in the summer of 1855. Before that, the Major had taken his men southwest to keep them from getting sick. They only got about nine miles away before the disease took hold among his men and they had to stop. Major Armistead returned to the fort and found that his wife had died. The Major was later killed during the Civil War in 1863, and after that, His ghost was seen wearing a dark blue uniform, kneeling and weeping at his wife's grave. A woman named Susan Fox lived with her stepfather in a small frame building across the creek from the Fort Riley trolley station in 1855. She was engaged to be married to a soldier who was away. She spent much of her time caring for people who had contracted cholera in the nearby town of Pawnee City. Her father was away when she contracted the dreaded disease herself, and she died alone at the house. Her fiancé returned and discovered her body. It was decided to bury her in her wedding dress in a small grave near the railway bridge to the trolley station. People who have lived in the house claim that Susan haunts the place. The first to do so was her fiancé, who said, It was a difficult passage for her, and Susan came back to her old home several times demanding to be let in. Yikes. (laughs) So I'm assuming he's sitting there one night and something starts pounding on the door. Residents have reported shrieks and strange noises, and one woman who was ironing <laughs> sorry <laughs> and one woman who was ironing when the apparition of Susan appeared threw the iron through the window. I'm assuming she was throwing it at the ghost, <laughs> I would imagine. A post commander got so fed up with the reports that he paid out of the fort's funds for a priest to come and exercise the house. That didn't work, so they demolished the house. That hasn't stopped Susan, who has been sighted hanging around the trolley station. And speaking of Pawnee City, which we just mentioned in that paragraph there, the first territorial capital of Kansas was built here along the eastern border of Fort Riley. Pawnee City eventually just became part of Fort Riley, and this is the only building that still exists from the town, so it's basically they call it a ghost town now. The building only served as the capital for five days before the capital was moved to another city. The Caw River Nature and History Trail is near the building. People claim to hear the sorrowful voice of a woman. One man described the voice singing a sad melody. He went to look for the woman who sounded as though she were near the river. He claimed to see the shaded form of a flatboat or barge being pulled across the river by a human-shaped shadow figure. When the apparition and the phantom boat reached the other side of the river, both vanished. Legend claims that a slave woman used to pull the ferry back and forth across the river and some believe that that is where this ghost originates. Fort Riley has been an important military base and continues to train America's fighting force. Soldiers don't typically welcome stories of the supernatural, nor do they readily share them. So hearing stories about ghosts on bases seems a little more believable. Is Fort Riley haunted? 
That is for you to decide. Lots of great stuff there. Thanks for suggesting it, Ed. And thank you to our military members out there, those who are veterans and those currently serving. We do appreciate you and hope that things don't get crazy in the world where you're going to be deployed once again. Absolutely. In a war zone. I want to encourage you guys to check out our website at historygoesbump.com. And if you'd like to send us some feedback, you can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. And you can make comments anywhere on our social media. We usually see them and try to respond back to you. We did get a couple over on YouTube, I noticed. We have one from C. Barton 537 This is under the Haunted Natchez Mansions. And this is actually, I think, our top video over there. It's got several thousands and thousands and thousands of views. So <laughs> I'm very happy about that because I originally made it just for our... Executive producers. Yeah, yeah. So we had like, you know, 20 people maybe looked at it. And I was like, you know, I'm going to start releasing these videos to the public because I put a lot of time and effort into these. Sure. And boy, am I glad I put that one out there. <laughs> A friend and I stayed at the Linden once. My friend says that she was woken in the middle of the night by someone massaging her legs. She said she wondered why I would be massaging her legs. (laughs) And when she looked up, there was no one there. I was still sound asleep in the bed on the other wall opposite of her. Oh, my goodness. Yikes. (laughs) I would no longer be in bed. Thank you. And then our shadow A commented under St. Ignatius Hospital. As you guys were talking about earlier, these ghosts and entities seem to feed off of or draw on our energy in order to manifest themselves or make themselves known. So I would think it probably had something to do with the fact that there were a whole bunch of teenagers on that particular tour, which probably gave the ghost entities a huge jolt of energy to work with. Because remember, the story was all these teenagers had come in to get a tour and it was really scary with lots of loud right. running around and stuff like that. And those kids really wanted to get out of the hospital because they were so scared. <laughs> right. It really wouldn't surprise me as poltergeist activity is usually centered around a teenager, especially one with a lot of angst and personal turmoil. What would be really interesting would be to take another group of teenagers in and see what, if anything, happens then. I want to thank you guys for tuning into this episode. I've been your host, Diane. And this has been Kelly. You take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This episode isn't brought to you by our executive producers. Be sociable. Drop the chain rattling, neck biting, and shape shifting, and join us on Facebook and Twitter at History Goes Bump. Like the page and follow us. which stretched 2,170 miles between the Missouri River and the Oregon Trail. Territory. (laughs) (laughs) Try it again. We're up really early. (laughs) (laughs) But we're excited. We're going to go meet the Pollies at their house. Because we've never met them before. We're going to go see their house. Well, you know what I mean. (laughs) The Pollies as in hillbilly horror stories. I think (laughs) most people know what we're talking about. I know, but maybe some don't. This whole paragraph makes me miss riding mahogany and doing jumps. <laughs> and I've done that down a very steep hill. Oh, my riding, God. But I had to lay all the way back. Like, my back was almost touching his ass. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. uh, God, it just looks be- terrifying. It's just amazing to think that the, he really, I mean, the, the stunt guy really did that ride. Yeah. And they're like, we're only doing it once. So that whole experience makes me think of a modern day cross country on horseback. I mean... All the different random jumps and everything. So you did that with your horse mahogany? I did. Not not the big stuff. Mm-hmm. The highest I think we ever jumped was 3.6, but he was a pretty good jumper for an Arabian. Cool. I had a friend when I lived back in Colorado that that's what she did. She had a cross country, I don't know what you call it, field that people could come and do their thing on. And yeah, she walked us around it. I mean, we didn't walk the whole thing. Obviously, they're huge. But I was just like, oh my gosh, horses are jumping over. It'd be like a big fallen tree (laughs) and all kinds of stuff. It was crazy. Yeah, they have some pretty big events out in Temecula with that. Very cool. My parents used to live. 
The house burned down many years ago, but apparently the writers are accompanying. There's a there's a fun word, accompanying. I mean, who writes these things and makes up these words? Accompanying. I mean, how accompanying? Accompanying. 